Football on Off The Ball. With Sky. Get more of the sports you love on Sports Extra with BT Sport and Premier Sports. So in these weeks before the live football returns, every Thursday night, John Giles is joining us to look back on one of the great managers of the 60s and 70s. Last week, we had a great response to his reflections on Don Revy. This week, we're looking back at the career of the great Matt Busby, and I'm delighted that for the first time in a while, John is with us in studio. Thank you, Nathan. You're looking well. Yeah, yeah. it's all the virus thing. We're hopefully getting past it. Hopefully, hopefully. Get get, uh, get on the screen a little bit. Exactly. We'll get you back a bit more. We'll try. Uh, As I said, we had a brilliant response to uh, your reflections on... Don Revy and I think it's important to do these because like for Matt Busby for even you know people of my age at this time we you know we hear the stories yeah. but often uh, they uh, take on a life of their own so it's uh, great to hear from somebody who was there and has a lot of personal reflections of them as well you said last week you know when you spoke about Don Revy about his importance to you and and your life uh, just how important he was Matt Busby what are your first things that come to mind when you're asked about Matt Busby uh Mostly good memories, Nathan, because, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, m- mainly because of the great Jackie Carey, Johnny Carey was called Manchester United, uh, Captain Manchester United, uh, when they won the Cup in 1948 with the great, the first great Manchester United mm. team. Uh, so m- myself and my pals were mostly, from a distance, Manchester United supporters. And... Uh, we didn't see much of them. I remember watching them in a, an exhibition match in Daily Mount, but there was no television then. You know, obviously no television. Mm. You couldn't see them. Uh, but because of, of uh, the great Jackie Carey, most of us uh, started to follow Man U from a distance. So he left an incredible record at Manchester United. He took over 1st of October 1945. Yeah. So just after the war didn't leave initially till the 4th of June 1969 within that time won five league titles the European Cup most famously in 1968 but also bought the club back from the brink after the Munich disaster as well but when you think what he had to go through firstly taking over at United straight after the war when, when football was just finding itself again and having to build the club up yeah. like he did that twice uh, well, probably probably did it three times uh, in the long run, uh, Nathan. Uh, but when he took over Manchester, we, when we spoke last week about managers, how you judge them, mm. I said, what did they take over and what did they leave? Right. Now, there's no doubt that Manchester, uh, I think Matt Busby, uh, history of Matt Busby, left more than anybody, any of the other managers, to be honest. Because when he took over... Uh, immediately after the war, which was 75, uh, 45, 46. Uh, Manchester United weren't the team in Manchester. Manchester City were the team in them. And it, they, there was uh, one of the stands would bomb down uh, because of the war. So he was taking over a club that hadn't been really up there mm. with the best. And the irony is that when we think of Manchester United now, like the two names that are synonymous are Alex Ferguson and Matt Busby. Mm. Matt Busby, his playing career was spent at Manchester City and Liverpool, their two greatest rivals. Yeah. Uh, and and obviously went through the war and Manchester United was his first job. So they were taking a chance on it. But Man City were the team prior to that. You know, Manchester United were, were only only came on because of Matt Busby, really, and he had a big job to do, uh, and he did an unbelievable job, uh, Nathan. You know, from the cup uh, with the great Jackie Carey again, a captain, won the cup in 1948, they won the league in 1952, right, and then he started the Busby Babes from that. And uh, like Matt Busby did something at a time when nobody else did it, which was to get young players into the club and put them in the team when they were very, very young. And one of the things he did, and this is what I believe happened, that in those days, uh, any club could only sign two players on uh, terms for the club, right? You're only allowed two. But what Matt Busby did, and I believe this to be correct, that he got lots of young players on the ground staff. So he was able to pay them, but not as players? Yes, so he's only allowed to. Okay. 
So, so he might have had with the with the young players that he that he got around that time when he when he started the Busby Babes. Uh, for example, he got Dunk, the great Duncan Edwards, mm. right? Well, Duncan Edwards was a it was a Wolverhampton lad and a Wolverhampton supporter. Bobby Charlton, one of the greatest ever, was a Newcastle guy. So he would well, obviously be paying him paying him a few quid, but that, but he would have had six or seven, right, of the young players on the ground staff. So he got ahead of everybody else. It took a, the other team, I think Wolves were the next to try and do that. But he got a head start with the Busby Babes at that particular time. But not only did he just do that and was ahead of everybody mm. else. And the great thing about Matt was one of the great things about Matt, he put them in the team. A lot of youngsters. I mean, in those days, I think you put one youngster in at a time. Right, so it was unusual. It wasn't the case, actually, no. that he had no choice but to pick young players, he was able to spot that this was an exceptional crop that yeah. deserved to be in there. And put them in, had the nerves to nerve to do it. I mean, he had a great team in, in, in uh, from 48 or 46, 47 mm. up to and, and that, that team had to be changed and they were a great team before that. I mean, the, 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 some people would remember the, uh, the names but the, they, they were world class players uh, I mean, I, I have I have them down here. Anyway, I won't I won't read them out. But they were, they were, for example, this in forty eight. Jimmy Delaney, Johnny Morris, Jack Rowley, uh, Stan Pearson, and Charlie Mitten. That was the forward line. They were famous. They were mm. brilliant. They won the cup. Uh, they, they won the cup. So, so, so when they came near the end, right now we had the young players to put in. But he put a lot of them in. No, nobody was doing that at that particular time. Like, it took a lot of courage, and that's what he did. And they became the Busby Babes, and they went on to to win things almost immediately. So he was the first to do that. And it's difficult when you're only when you're the first to do anything. I did it. He set the trend, and it took the the other clubs. Wolverhampton were the next one to do it to catch up with Matt Busby at that particular time. It's at that time. 56, 57 when they're winning league titles with the Busby Babes that you're thinking about moving to England and thinking about signing for Manchester United. How much did you know about Busby and what interactions did you have at, with him before you went to the club? I, I didn't have any interaction with him. We had Billy Bean was a scout uh, uh, at in, Dub, in Ireland mm. and he sent me over uh, because I was playing, obviously playing school by football, and he was a friend of my father, so he knew me well. So he sent, I see, he sent me over when I was fourteen. You couldn't go permanently until you were fifteen. So I was there for four weeks uh, because they wanted to, they wanted to keep me ahead of any other okay. club. So uh, and it was great, Nathan. I, uh, I went there the pre-season and I could watch them. I was playing a bit myself with the other lads. I was only fourteen, but I could watch the practice matches. And the amount of talent I, I I knew about the Busby Bay, but I didn't know the the, the, the exact amount of talent that, yeah. was, that was there. So I was able to watch the first team first, the second team. The two full teams. Bobby Charlton, I think, was seventeen at that time. And he, he was absolutely brilliant. At, at, even at that particular stage, could only get on at half time. Do you know what I mean? Duncan Edwards was. I think Duncan was in the army. The amount of talent they had at that club was was was, was incredible. Uh, so I was there for the summer. And were you in any way overawed? No, but because I was playing with the youngsters. You know what I mean? There was, so you trusted there was, there that you'd be able to get towards that, that yeah. level over and a couple of years. They were with the, the older yeah. lads. But it was the amount of talent that was there. And what was, what was great about Busby, he put those lads in at a very, very mm. young age, which was very, very courageous at any time, but particularly at that time. But nobody else was doing it. Well, they didn't have the talent because he was ahead of them because he put them on the ground staff and that. So Duncan Edwards and Bobby, uh, uh, Dennis Voyle, uh, uh, Taylor, uh, all these great players before the Munich Air disaster. This, I, was that, I was there in 1955. Uh, I, I, I didn't go permanently until 1956. Mm. And when you think back to watching Duncan Edwards and Bobby Charlton at an incredibly young age and the conversations you've had since about Bobby Charlton has been by far and away the best player you ever played with or mm. played against. Yeah. Would Duncan Edwards have been that player if it wasn't for Munich? It, it could have been. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing him through young eyes mm. at that time and I thought he was outstanding. Uh, uh, but what, like when the competitive matches were on, when I went the next year, I hardly saw the matches because I was playing in the, in the junior team right. myself. Uh, 
But, but what I did see of him was, was unbelievable. And, and what Bobby did, uh, you know, later on. I mean, Bobby was the best player I played with or against. He was just fantastic. And, uh, and in many ways, it, sound, it sounds odd. He wasn't that enjoyable to play with, Nathan. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, this sounds odd. Because uh, I, I, I played, in, when I got in the team, inside right, Bobby was inside left. And there was a lot of times Bobby would get the ball and you'd be in a good position, right? A lot of times you wouldn't get it. Sometimes, but most times you wouldn't get it. But if you were just about to say, for some say, Bobby, Bobby's beat three or four players. Smacked it in the top corner. So, <laughs> either foot, in yeah, the yeah. top corner. So you couldn't say anything. You know, you know like when I played later on with say with, say with Bremner, we could talk about we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do it on the pitch and that. Bobby, Bobby, I'll, I'll give you an, a, 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 an example. When you you're playing inside right and inside left in those days, when the ball goes dead behind the goals that's the time you, you, you get back to positions do you know mm. what I mean in other words I'm the inside right uh, I got right hand side Bobby then could have been and then he's on the left side but when that happened Bobby used to wander over to me right and I said Bobby push over after three times Bobby push over F off <laughs> and leave me alone do you know what I mean right. he just did what did you say I couldn't say anything. <laughs> he was Bobby Charlton. I was three years young. Yeah, Bobby. Yeah. Bobby. But it was mainly when he got the ball and you're in a good position because you were told at Old Trafford, if someone's in a good position, let it go simple and quick. I'd be in a good quite a little, not all the time, quite a few times. Didn't get it from Bobby. But just what I'd be about to say, say Bobby, three or four players. And Bobby scored 270 odd goals. Yeah. As a genuine midfielder. Midfield. At the same time, scored 50 odd goals, leading goal scorer for England. Bobby was phenomenal. But I never had a discussion. About the game with Bobby, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't interested. He was right. able to do it. He couldn't quite understand how he did it. It just it happened. Just from... did, yeah, yeah, but he, he was quick. Yeah, he could beat players. Uh, he had a great shot on both feet, right? So you, you couldn't say anything. You couldn't say anything to him. You know what I mean? He's whopping him, and he scored two hundred and seventy goals, uh, and and never really had a discussion with Bobby about the game. So that interest that Busby had in young players and developing young players. Would he then have been at all your youth games? Like, would you have would you have met him quite early on when you went over and signed? Would yeah, would you have yeah. had conversations with him about what he expected for you at, at a not, club not, like Manchester really. United? At, at that time, Nathan, the, 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 he he was the boss, but you had Jimmy Murphy who was the assistant manager. He was the man. He was the man who put the young the young players into the first team. Right. Jimmy Murphy was brilliant. So you're the way you were talking initially was that Busby should get the credit. But was it actually Jimmy Murphy who was identifying them? Well, 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 Jimmy would get a lot of credit, but Matt was the boss. Mm. You know what I mean? He he had to get it because he 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 employed Jimmy for what Jimmy could do, and what Jimmy could give to him. Right, right. Because he's not going to be able to do it on his own. He's he's not going to have the time. But it's very important that you pick the right man to do it and trust him. And Jimmy Murphy was totally different to Matt. Matt was a very gentlemanly type of fellow. He was he was deadly as well, but he was very gentle. Jimmy was into it. Right. Well, Jimmy was a hard... 15, 16, Jimmy be, he was pushing you. Jimmy would be a hard nut, but demanded, demanded an awful lot, but knew the game. Like, his demands were correct in what he wanted young players to do, but no messing about with Jimmy. No messing about. But he was... Jimmy was hugely influential at Old Trafford. He was in charge of the youth team. He won the youth cup for the first five years that, 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 that it was there. He was in charge of the, the reserve team, so the centre league... Jimmy had more time with the young players than Matt Busby did, right? And then Jimmy would have to say, right, he's ready, he's ready. Jimmy knew the game really well and, and was tough, but he was hugely influential. Matt wouldn't have had the time to do what, what Jimmy did, right? But Jimmy was brilliant at what he did. But he was a hard nut, uh, Nathan. He had me crying one time. Oh, really? Yeah, I was playing at uh, Huddersfield. I was only about 17 at the time. And... Uh, played at Huddersfield in the Central League because the Central League team was a really big team and I missed a penalty in the last couple of minutes he came I thought you never missed a penalty <laughs> I did I did <laughs> I missed a few but uh, he came in and he had a right go at me and I, I started crying believe it or not you know? right and uh, then we played those that was at Christmas you played three matches in four days Yeah. and we played Huddersfield the next day at Old Trafford and we won and I scored scored a good goal and 
I was going, to, going home, home, home for Christmas for a couple of days, and Jimmy said, yeah, tell your dad I'm pleased with you. <laughs> that was Jimmy saying... That was as good as it gets. Sorry about... Yeah. Sorry about yesterday. He said, tell your dad I'm pleased with you. And that was Jimmy. But he was hugely influential. Like, if you hear uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby would, would uh, an awful lot to say about Jimmy, and most of the players, that, because Jimmy was... He knew the game, knew what you had to do, and he was hard nut in those days, like he was real hard nut to do it. But he made any of the players that you talk about that came through. Jimmy would be hugely responsible for that. So when you were over there then, as a youngster before you made the first team, it was actually all about Jimmy Murphy far more than impressing Matt Busby. Well, well, for for, for, for strange as it may seem, when when I first went over, my father wanted me to work in a factory learning it, and that wasn't working. So Jimmy did you Murphy, do that? Hmm? Did you do that for a few weeks when you went over? I did it for a year. Right. Yeah. What sort of a factory? Hmm? What sort of a factory? It was um, uh, an engineering firm, electrical right. engineering firm. Smith, Smithfield and Cowns was the name of it. All time, I'll never forget it. And it was amazing because I'm now dealing with English lads. And funny enough, the, the most they, they were mostly United. Right. Uh, and they were brilliant. They were brilliant. Alan, Alan Cook and uh, the Brown brothers, they were terrific to me because uh, I did. But what happened, Nathan, I, I, I had a broad Dublin accent and they obviously had the Manchester accents. I couldn't understand a word they said and they couldn't understand a word I said. And I remember thinking, I don't know how I'm going to live here. Yeah, it was all a nod and a wink. <laughs> but we got used to each other. Yeah. Uh, and then Jimmy Murphy said, look, this is not working out. So they took me on. This was in uh, 56, 57, uh, I was going. He said, "I'm going to sign you pro in November, but we want you to come on playing now." And and this was at the time of the Busby Babes, Nathan. There must have been like forty, at least forty top class players. Yeah, and the youngsters as well. And you've seen them, you've seen the top class players. You've already watched them at training. You've trained with them. Like, trained, yeah, does any part of you think I mightn't be able for this? Well, to be honest, I was lost at that particular time. Right, I was in the reserve team dressing room, but there was about forty pros. And, and like in the first team dressing, you had the top lads, uh, Duncan Edwards, Tommy Taylor, and that. And, and, and I was lost among those guys because when you were doing the training, you just went out on the track and you did it yourself. There was nobody in charge of the training until the ball, to get the balls out. So I'm running around, I'm, I'm scared to go past Tommy Taylor. Or the, and some of them were, 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 were friendlier than others. Eddie Coleman, for example, was really yeah. friendly. And look, Liam Whelan was there at that time. Liam was very good. good. But say Duncan Edwards, Tommy Taylor, David Pegg wouldn't be friendly. Not that they wouldn't notice you. They'd just walk past you and that. So I was a bit lost at that at that particular time. Uh, I never. I, I, I don't know why. And when you think of where uh, the world was and where football was with money at the time, but I assumed when you moved to Manchester United that they just took care of everything and you moved into digs and you didn't need to worry about money. That everything was just looked after. That you had to go. So you're working what five days a week and going in training in the evenings, or? Well, when I started first the first year, when I was working in the mm. factory, was I went to uh, uh, Tuesday night and Thursday night training, right? One at Old Trafford and then up at the Cliff, which was another place altogether. And that's that's what I did. Uh, so uh, then Jimmy Murphy said, said, right, you have to come in or not sort of be signed pro. You have to be doing it full time. That's when I was mixing with the lads. This was before the Munich Air disaster. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Charlton, some were friendly, some were so but uh, but I felt a bit lost at uh, at that that particular time. There's so many great players in it, you know. Uh, I was playing the junior team at that time. It's probably a, a difficult question to answer because you were so young at the time and weren't in with the first team. But like Munich is obviously such a seminal event in Matt Busby's life, and you know, incredibly lucky to even survive it. But mm -hmm. to see. Uh, the team that he's built in a sporting sense but also you know, friends uh, oh, yeah. players he put so much trust in like the club that he has built up over the previous yeah. 12, 13 years ripped apart must have been just so devastating did you did you see it change in him post Munich or people you spoke to would they have seen a different Matt Busby as as he got got his health back um, well Jimmy Murphy was was in charge at that particular time and, and, and as you say it was it was a huge change I mean there was uh, some of the great players and, and some of the ordinary players were, were, were killed in the Munich Air disaster I mean it destroyed the club mm. as a football team at that particular time you know I, mean, I don't 
read out the list, but there's a list of terrific players: Liam Whelan, Tommy Taylor, uh, they all killed in the Munich. I mean, it 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 ruined the club. Uh, the Matt Busby himself was badly injured. Uh, he did come back to it, and Jimmy Murphy took charge at that particular time, and he brought a couple of players in, Ernie Taylor and Stan, uh, Crowther, that they were allowed to do because it's and they actually got to the cup final. Uh, but Matt Busby was very badly injured, so it was very, very difficult for him to come back. And it was amazing. He made an amazing comeback. Do you remember him coming back? I do, yeah. I remember the, 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 he had a meeting with all the players in the, in the, the gym and uh, he broke down crying. He couldn't, he couldn't handle, handle that. These were lads who, who were killed that he brought along as 15 or 16-year-olds. Mm. Uh, so it was a very difficult time. But he, he recovered quite quickly to take charge of the team again. But that was the break, though. I mean, that, that team, after the Munich Gators, that's went to Busby Babes. Mm. You know, there was quite a few players that came in. Uh, you know, uh, Albert, Albert Quicksall, David Hurd. So about six players came in from different clubs, which changed it. The club an awful lot. Nathan. Just on that day, Busby came back, and and those few weeks, like again, you're you're a very young man in a in a different country, and this like Munich is a, a worldwide event mm-hmm. where everybody's aware of what what a shocking tragedy it is. Like, how are you during those those weeks? And and because you say you're you know you're on a training ground with a lot of these players. I'm sure you, we closed down for a few weeks. You see, they told us to close down. And I went to quite a few funerals, although I was only only a young fella. Mm. Uh, and then then we got training again, you know, uh, which was was very very difficult. I mean, I was only only a young fella, and I was then playing in the reserves, which was way beyond what what I, mm. I could do with that. It was just it was just total upset, and mostly funerals. And and they said, don't come back, don't come into the ground for two or three weeks. And although I didn't know the players, it was it was your duty to go to the funerals. Sure, Came yeah. over to Dublin for Liam Whelan's funeral, and I mean, I, I think if it happened now, we would have had people in to help us, mm. young young players, because we we didn't know what was going on. It was it, it, this disaster was incredible, you know. And you're you're in digs, as you me- you mentioned early on in digs. Like before I came away to England, they said digs, they come around and look after you and see how, see are you okay. You didn't see anybody. Nathan. It was the survival of the fittest. Yeah. You just had to get on with what you were doing. You didn't. There was nobody looking after you at all. Uh, so the Munich air disaster was 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 dreadful. And then we came back training again. And uh, after the Munich air, they brought Jack Crompton back as a trainer. He'd been the goalkeeper in this '78, which, to be honest, was a blessing for me because Jack Crompton got grip of the training. They were training as a group. Before that, like this is the, the pre-Munich, yeah, you went around the pitch and I said, I was only a kid, Duncan Edwards, Tommy Taylor, all these guys train. I was, I was just totally lost because that's, it wasn't pushy or anything mm-hmm. like that. But Jack Crompton came in and he had group training, which was which much easier for, for the likes of myself and, and a few of the other young young lads. But it was it was different, of course. It was different. After that initial day when Busby broke down, would he... Would he ever speak about it again? Would like... I never heard him talking about it again, and I never heard any of the lads that survived. Right, uh, like Harry Gregg was a hero in the, in mm. the, the Munich Gardens. That she went back into the plane and pulled a few of uh, Busby included out. But Harry would never talk about. And it. you would have never spoken about it no. with them. No, he wouldn't want to. Mm. Uh, but Harry later on and did speak about it a lot. But it would be eight years, nine years, ten years. Uh, later on for some reason when I think of managers of that era I always imagine them in their big office with the feet up and the cigarette in the mouth and watching down as training happens below but you were saying last week like Don Revy was very very well, it was, it was yeah it was different it was, altogether it was like, Busby Matt, like that Matt, in Matt Busby's case he was uh, uh, he, he, he they didn't do it like that Jack Crompton was doing it uh, but it, it, then then you had the, the, the situation where the Busby babes had gone Right now we had to rebuild, rebuild uh, uh, Nathan, and like it was ten years later they, they won the European Cup. But if you look back at the team that won the European Cup in '68, they nearly back to Busby Babes again. Nobby Styles got in the team. Yeah. Uh, Tony Dunn came in the team. Uh, 
but there was only about two, two players, three players that were bought players. Like just after the Munich air disaster, right? There was Albert Quicksall, David Hurd, uh, Noel Cantwell. Uh, there was about six players, bonus setters. Mm. That wasn't the Busby Babes anymore, you know? Because what happened then? Those players were players of, of older players, you used to, to used to other clubs, mm. and and I think a lot of their attitude was, Matt Busby doesn't do anything. Okay. You know so what I mean? Didn't understand the dynamic of how no, he ran how things. It had, how it had how it had been before. And how did you find that when you look back now on working with Revy, who seemed to have a mix in that he was very good at identifying young players, but also had the, I don't know, the self-confidence or the trust in bringing in uh, Bobby Collins, an established player who could be a big personality and who might try and lay down the law in his own way, whereas Matt Busby didn't seem to want those type of figures. No. no the, the Busby Babes was, was brought up the Busby in his way. way. Uh, Jimmy Murphy, this is what you mm. do. And that, 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 that broke it, you see, after you, because you're getting players in that weren't Busby babes. So if you look at it, it, it took a good while to get back to the Busby way. You know, so, so Matt did it. He did it, first of all, with the, the first team, with a great team. Then he did it with the Busby babes. And then he did it again to win the European Cup in 68. In, in, in Don Reeve's case, uh, Don Reeve had it was a different situation in that when he took over at Leeds, Leeds had no history they were second division team, yeah. right? So Don Don had to make the most of what he got. Like Matt Busby had the pick of the young players that came in, Duncan Edwards, but, uh, but all those those the great players. Uh, Leeds weren't um, th- like that. Now we got Bobby Collins in from Everton, who was an experienced player and a great player, in my opinion, and was a huge influence at Leeds. But there was players like Terry Cooper, Paul Reaney, Paul Madeley, Norman Hunter. At, in my time at Old Trafford, wouldn't have got into Old Trafford as outstanding schoolboys. So Don had a lot of work along with Sid Owen, who was, was a good coach, a terrific player in his day, had to work, yeah, in my a, opinion, a, different a lot harder to make these players what they became. Now, they had the right attitude, Norman Hunter. and Actually, Norman Hunter, uh, funny enough, before Don Revy took over, was released by the previous manager. And Revy just spotted something in him. Brought him back. Right. No one could have been out of it, but Paul Madeley, uh, Paul Reaney, Terry Cooper wouldn't have got into Old Trafford at the time when I was there with the Busby Babes on ability. But what they did have, along with Don and Sid Owen, a work ethic, they were brilliant. Brilliant. Became great players. Became great players. And that was down to Don and his attitude toward these, towards these players. And when you're then building, say, from sort of 59 through to 63 and becoming a real established part of the United team, building up towards that FA Cup final, what was Revy, or what was Busby like with you? Would he, you know, would he take his side at times, give you advice in your game, you know, uh, know when to G up, know when to give you a bit of a kicking? Uh, yeah, it, well, it, very, very seldom, very seldom. But what happened with, between me and the Munich Air disaster and uh, the 63 Cup final? Uh, Matt fell out with me and I fell out with him but he more or less fell out with me what happened was I think it was in 1961 or 62 we played Spurs in the semi-final of the cup and I was playing in the main as as the main midfield player Bobby Charlton was on the left wing that time and what had happened I went to see a match uh, with Manchester City and Fulham where the great Johnny Haynes was playing for Fulham like in those days, if you had if you inside right, you stayed on the inside right situation. If you were inside left, you stayed on the inside left. But Haynes that day went wherever the ball was. So if the left back had it, he was receiving it. Right back he was and I thought this was great. Right, yeah. Because now you don't have to wait for the ball, you can go and get the ball. Right? But Haynes was about twenty seven, twenty eight. I was only twenty at the time. And I did it. Right. And the next day I heard Jimmy Murphy saying uh, Johnny Haynes is one of the best displays he's ever seen. And I thought, I'm going to try and do that, which I did, but I wasn't able for it. Right. Right. So that it, it came to a head when we played the semi final of the cup against Spurs, the great Spurs team. Uh, Danny Glanchler, John White, Jimmy Greaves, uh, uh, Dave Mackay, great players. And I had a nightmare. I 
could, I wasn't able for it. I thought I could do it. I wasn't able. Be, I'm sure, that wasn't the first day you tried to replicate Johnny Haynes, was it? Oh no, you've been no, doing no, it all I'd be, season. I've been doing it okay, but this came to a big game, it was a semi final of the cup, and I didn't do it. And had nobody said to you before that, when you were trying it in previous matches and league matches, no, uh, John, I, this isn't this isn't no, the game I, plan. I was, I was actually doing it. Okay, I was doing okay. But when you came Bobby up against better the left wing at that time. And was Bobby not getting annoyed that you were picking the ball up off the left back? No, no, because I was distributing the ball. I was getting the ball out to out to yeah. out to Bobby. So everything was okay. But we got beaten in that match. And I, Matt for, well so you know what somebody loses confidence in you. He never said anything to me after the match. He, then I was pushed out to the right wing. Uh and th- from that and I was playing the, the following season on the right wing and I couldn't do right for wrong. I was having a really bad time with him. Uh and that was we, we were having a bad time in the league as well. Uh, and did he ever say anything to you? No. And would you have approached him? No, I never did. I never did. But he didn't pull me to one side and say, "Look, I know you were young." It wasn't like that. It was out. Then the following season, I played most of the time on the right wing, and then played in the cup final in sixty sixty three. But Novi Stars had been playing in the team. I'd been left out of the team, although I would played in all the rounds in that. But if Nobby had been fit for the final, I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have played okay. in the final. It was really bad, you know, really bad. Uh, and it was then after the cup final, we played in the Charity Shield, we lost, and I was left out of the team again. So, so I decided then it was, it was time to time to go. But when I asked for the transfer uh, at the time, he, he didn't try to talk try to talk me out of it. You know, what did he say? He didn't say anything. I put you on. The, yeah, I said, well, I think it'd, it'd be better if I moved. Okay. And he said, well, I'll put it, put it before the directors. Well, he didn't need to put it before the directors. Then came back and said, but I was only in the transfer list for two days. Uh, and, and then Don, Don came in. And, and then you're taking, you're in the, the lap of the gods then. Yeah. But one of the reasons I left and went to Leeds was Bobby Collins. I knew Bobby Collins was a great player. Uh, Leeds had had a good run from Christmas to the end. So there was hope there, Nathan. But when you gamble as a professional footballer, or when you move, transfer, it's a gamble because you don't know what's going to happen, really. I was asking you last week uh, about Don Revy. Was he, you know, was what sort of a loser he was when things didn't go well? What about Matt Busby? If you lost the big match, oh, in Matt, the was, room Matt, Matt was was brilliant. Matt was brilliant in it. He kept a cool head all the time, and he was it was he was a type of manager. If you were winning one nil, and you were going for the second goal, and you lost it, and it was one mm-hmm. one, he'd come into the dressing room and say, "That was the right thing to do." If that happens again, that's what I want you to do. He, he, he was brilliant at... I only saw him lose his head once. And that was with a player who came in at half-time, moaning and groaning, who was at fault for a goal. And he said, you're too melty. <laughs> but and after that, and we, we, didn't, we lost a good few matches when I was playing in the team. But he, he wouldn't, uh, wouldn't slag you off for the sake of it. OK. No. He said, if, if that was the thing to do. That was the right thing to do. He was very, very good. He had a great attitude in terms of keeping his head and not losing his head in that. He, as you say, built maybe three great teams from the side that he initially took over just after the war, uh, rebuilding then after Munich, and then the team goes on and wins the European Cup. Yeah. The Busby Babes had won the league in 56 and 57. Yeah. If Munich hadn't have happened, would they have dominated the next 10, 15 years? Because when you go through the role of honour, like Wolves win the next couple of titles, Liverpool win a couple of titles, Everton are there, Tottenham, mm-hmm. Leeds obviously win a couple of titles. Like there's a real spread of league winners. Yeah. If Is your sense from having been a part of it and playing against them over those years that if Munich hadn't happened that United would have... I think they would have, I think they would have dominated for the foreseeable future and, be, and beyond that. Mm. Because it's hard to know what's going to happen in in that, but th- there was no reason why the only the only team that was competing against them at that time was Wolves. But they weren't in the same class as United at that particular time, as you said, it won it twice on the bounce anyway, and the team was only average age was only about twenty two, and players coming on, like Bobby Charlton was only coming into the team at that time. You know, Liam Whelan had, had had been in the team. Dennis Vi- Dennis Violet was one of the Great players, in my opinion, uh, Tommy Taylor. The, the, you couldn't see anybody stopping them. Yeah. 
Wolves were the nearest to them. Wolves actually won the Munich disaster happened. Wolves won the league. That the United had been but in front, but obviously they lost all the players. I think for the foreseeable future, and I'm talking about two years, three years, four years, maybe five years, that United could only get better at that particular time. What about the team then that went on to win the European Cup in 1968? I'm sure you played against them many times through the years. He he obviously trusted talent. He trusted yeah. Bobby Charlton to be able to go and play the game. He you know he let George Best become the genius that he was. Didn't it? It, it didn't seem from you know the few matches you can look back on that he did he ever really try to restrict them or get them to play within a system. No, it, 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 like if you look at it from the time of the Munich air disaster, where it was the Busby Babes, then the Bus, Busby Babes ceased to be because there was other players coming in from the club. But over time, if you look at it, Albert Quicksall went out of the team, Morris Sellers went out of the team, Noel Cantwell came out of the team, and it was young United players that came into the team. So it was more like the Busby Babes in 68 than it had been immediately after the Munich air disaster. Yeah. Bobby Charlton was, was obviously still playing and, 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 and great. Uh, but they, and, and, and they won it in 68. But funny enough... That was the that was the end of that recovery. You know, uh, Man City started coming into mm-hmm. it. Leeds started to come into it. Liverpool started to come into it. And Manchester United actually from the the Munich uh, from the winning the European Cup in '68 were on a decline. And don't forget, they were, I think they were relegated in was it '72 around that. The Dennis Law game mm-hmm. when Dennis Law had left. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it it, it didn't maintain the Busby prominence that we'd seen in the early days because there were other teams were coming on Liverpool were coming on Manchester City were coming on Leeds were coming on at that particular time Did anyone get special treatment? I'm thinking I'm thinking about George Best and I know you were probably at the club for a very short period of time together and that he basically made his debut I think just after as, as you were leaving the club I like, played two play, games with him Players with that talent was, were they uh, given special treatment? Uh, no no, there'll be no special treatment uh, 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 for Georgie. Uh, and Georgie was was unlucky in many ways that he came on at the time that he did. You see, Matt Busby was, was an, old, an old-fashioned manager. He was, he, was, he was getting on a bit at that time. And uh, Matt Busby was brought up with Tom Finney and Stanley Matthews and these guys. Like, that's they were ordinary lads at that time. There wasn't the superstars that Georgie best into, into the period that Georgie was there. The world had changed at that time. You know what I mean? Georgie Best came into the time of the Beatles, right? Matt Busby wasn't used in any way to the time of the Beatles. Yeah. He was used to Tom Finney and they lived in digs and they did all that. Georgie Best came in, it, I left the team in uh, 63. I played too much with him and, and, and Georgie became a superstar overnight. This was the time of the Beatles. This was the time of change in Britain. Young girls and young fellas were going out to discos mm. and all that. Bit more money. Yeah, yeah, but, but Matt didn't see that. You know, Matt saw that. You know, should Georgie nowadays they're in they're in hostels, mm. protected. Georgie's got no protection. He was the first. He was the first superstar to be what he was, right? And George was in digs, like people could come knocking at the door. So I think George finished up going into town to get out of the way, right? But Matt didn't, in my opinion, didn't see it. He'd had superstars as well. He had Bobby Charlton and Tommy Taylor and all these guys. Quiet lads. They they didn't need any yeah. any protection. Georgie did. You know, George was only seventeen when he got in the first team, and he was a, a genius overnight. But unfortunately, he he he, he went astray. Georgie. I mean, Georgie was, and in my opinion, finished at like twenty two, twenty three. The life he led, but he, he got no protection. If it was today, Georgie would have been in. Hostels away from every protected in that, but Matt Busby, nobody at that time knew. Well, it all happened so quickly, and on. I guess as you say, like at yeah. that stage, he's nearly in the job twenty years. He's probably mid fifties at a time when mid fifties was seen as being quite yeah, old well, he, in, in football. Yeah, in football in terms, yeah, he, he didn't understand. He didn't. Like, he, he say, wouldn't have seen he's, it. He's managing one of the Beatles all of a sudden. He doesn't even understand what it is. No, no, nobody did mm. at that time. Do you know what I mean? I was five years older than Georgie. Uh, I was gone at that stage. Uh, but m- most lads at, around that time would, would be mar- married young and settled down and all that. 
When George came to the time of the Beatles where nobody knew us, discos were coming out, you know, girls were going out, the freedom, there was a freedom that had never been there before. And it was very difficult for anybody to see it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but in Matt's case, he, he, he... I mean, there was lads before... You going out, John? <laughs> I, wasn't, no, I, was, I was married at that time. <laughs> uh, but before that, like, the, Dennis Violet was, was a terrific player. Yeah. Dennis used to like the, the nightlife and that. And, and Matt would know that. John Charles... He liked the nightlife, didn't he? No, I think John was okay. No, no John, was, John was one of the great players. John Charles, he was one of the great players. No, I think he he was. He went to, yeah. he went to Italy. one of the first players to go yeah, to, yeah. to Italy and be a success. Yeah. I mean, he was one of the greatest players of all time. Yeah. John Charles. Yeah, but uh, but but Georgie was Georgie was unlucky in many ways. You know, wrong time. He wasn't he wasn't protected in a way that he should have been. Like I, I think in his career, I think Georgie was finished. At, 22 or 23 years of age for what he could have been he was sensational uh, Busby's uh, long term legacy you know stands up incredibly the statue in front of Old Trafford and the brilliance of the Busby babes the couple of years after he left though and the handover like it, every you know again Ferguson uh, somewhat reminiscent the difficulty of stepping away like, he more than any other manager it seems really struggled to not be the manager of the football club anymore Oh, definitely. I, I, see, I'll only give you my theory on it. Like Matt Busby's time, even Matt Busby. I don't think Matt Busby and managers of their time, Stan Cullis and that, could retire financially secure. I just want. I mean, if you go back to 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 to, to the Wolves manager, like he, he's he, supporters had to to. to get him out of trouble selling these, mm. these houses they, they just Bill Nicholson you know finished up the charge of the, the, the juniors Re, the Celtic manager Jock Jock Steen, Steen yeah. finished working in the one of the offices so these guys like Matt Busby I think he was about 60 when he stepped away uh, he lived for another yeah, 24 years is that what he was, was he yeah. wasn't more than that even no so no. he died when he was 84 and 94 so yeah he was about basically about 60 yeah. when he retired well I don't I don't I don't think Matt Busby would have been financially secure at that particular time don't see why he could and all the others weren't so you think it was more a case of not that he didn't want to leave he just couldn't leave he couldn't I don't think he could and and, and, and when he couldn't leave you see and like what managers as, as powerful as Matt Busby have to go I mean Matt Busby made uh, Wilf McGuinness manager mm. Wilf wasn't able for that I knew Wilf quite quite well and Wilf, Wilf finished with an injury mm. was man, man you mad you know that was his and 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 he would have been delighted to be made manager but Wilf wasn't able for it Would he have been able for it if Busby wasn't standing over his shoulder the whole time? He'd have a better chance mm. but I think Manchester United needed a, a clean break a, a clean break with a top manager coming in. And Wilf was, Wilf suffered. I mean, Wilf finished yeah. with a nervous breakdown in, in, in you know, because yeah, of the situation. Struggles, yeah. Because he was, like Matt Busby would have his, been his idol. So instead of letting Wilf get on with it, that, that, that wasn't the case. Matt was still there. Yeah, the fact mind. he was there, the presence was there, yeah. you know? And, 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 and it was getting worse, Nathan. You know what I mean? The, the results weren't good. Wilf was in trouble. Georgie, Georgie was carrying on a bit. He had, he had to sort that out. Uh, you know, there was a stage I think we played him in the cup, uh, Man U, and uh, Georgie was found with a, a girl in the afternoon of the match. You know, this was deadly stuff, deadly stuff, and Wilf had to handle that. Yeah. So you, they basically became the talk of the town, United at, at that stage. Oh yeah, yeah. Then then Frank Frank O'Farrell took over, who had a very very good record. Frank was a gentleman. I got to know him reasonably well, gentleman. But I think he complained afterwards. He, he wasn't. That Matt, Matt was a hindrance rather than a help. Yeah. Because he was still there when when uh, Frank O'Farrell was there, which which is a shame, you know, for Matt Busby's record. You know, like of all the managers that I think he's Matt's done more than any, any of the other managers that we talk about, whether it be Don Brevi or uh, Stan Collis or anything else. I think he might, and I think it was a shame that it it he had to be told to leave. Yeah. To leave. Yeah, clearly a remarkable man with the way he brought United back after the war, after the Munich disaster and then ultimately to that European Cup success. Uh, anything we've left out on 
Matt Busby? Uh, no, he just he, he did it in a natural way. Uh, he, he was a very gentlemanly type of man. You know, like I've seen him when I was dealing when I was leaving. I was I was a little bit cheeky, and uh, he'd never lose his head. When I was dealing with him, he, he had blue eyes, and they were getting brighter and brighter and brighter because I was giving him a little bit of cheek. Right. And what were you saying? I, well, I hadn't I hadn't signed my contract for the next season, and everybody else had, right? Because I was looking looking to get away, and I said I'm not I'm not signing the contract. You see, and and I could see the last person that he wanted to be talking to him like that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so I could see his eyes. Get, I could see his eyes getting bluer. Yeah, yeah, and bluer. Yeah. The longer it went on, he still didn't lose the head, but his eyes were getting bluer and bluer. And I knew he wanted to choke me, <laughs> <laughs> but he but he didn't. And uh, like he, he was he was very 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 gentlemanly, but deadly when he had to be. Nathan, you know, deadly when he had to be. Yeah. Uh, John, it's been brilliant uh, reminiscing on Matt Busby and we've a huge amount of messages in uh, from people who are watching on so it's great to see you back uh, in the studio fit and healthy and hope to see lots more of you over the next while as well uh, All Our Football and Off The Ball is brought to you by Sky get more of the sports you love and sports extra with BT Sports and Premier Sports John, great stuff as always Thank you Nathan and I hope you, your, your, your listeners enjoy it and we'll, we'll have a go at somebody else next week Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great stuff okay. Thanks John Thanks, thanks Nathan Thank you Football on Off The Ball With Sky Get more of the sports you love on Sports Extra with BT Sport and Premier Sports